Stay right there in your easy chair For 30 minutes of pleasure Don't you go, it's more than the show It's the talk of the desert It's the talk of the desert with Paul and the I just love coming home at night I turn around, she's a treasure Everyone and everywhere I go the now, here's Melinda. Well, I am so honored and thrilled to have one of my favorite guests back on Talk of the Desert, and he's performing here in the desert on December 9th, and that's Tom Dreesen. Tom, welcome back to Talk of the Desert. I, oh, I'm glad to be back. I don't know how many times you've been a guest, but... Uh, I'll be back with Fran Francesco. Francuso. Oh, Francuso. Oh, Francuso is my dog, <laughs> the mascot of Talk of the Desert. Um, yes, but he, you know, he, I don't know, he got up. I thought he wanted to be the star on the show today. But uh, you're performing at the McCallum Theater. Yeah, I'm really excited. December 9th. How, yeah, it is exciting. Yeah, because I've never performed. In all my years of coming down here to the desert, I've been coming here since like the early 80s, and, and I have not ever performed at McCallum. I performed all around here, I'm of course in the Bob Hope Classics and the Frank Sinatra tournaments, but never at the McCallum. And it's exciting. I'm bringing my one-man show here. You know. And it's a great one-man show. I have seen it a couple of times. Mm, thank you. And it's really phenomenal. Let's talk about it. It's called um, An Evening of Laughter and Memories of Sinatra. Yeah, and I change it sometimes oh. in some cities, no, to an evening of laughter and stories of Sinatra, only because people will say to me, people will say, oh, uh, uh, does he sing? Is he going to sing a song? And I say, no, I don't sing. In <laughs> fact, you know, once in a while I'd be singing in my dressing room and Frank would just open the door and look at me. He wouldn't say a word. He'd look at me and I'd go, okay, I get it, I get it. So I, it's story. You know, it's, it's a, in, in all the years I toured with Frank, 14 years, in 45, 50 cities a year, you know, uh, I, I, this is an, what it is. It's a retrospective of my life, of my childhood, but it ends up with Sinatra. And the, it, of all the things I've done, the hundreds of appearances on television, the, the 61 appearances on The Tonight Show, and Letterman, hosting Letterman, no one ever asked me about that. I toured with Sammy Davis for three years. I toured with Dean. I toured with uh, Matt, Mac Davis and Natalie Cole and, and uh, Smokey Robinson. And, but Everywhere I go, people would want to know about Sinatra. I was running a marathon for multiple sclerosis. My sister Darlene had MS, so we called it 26 Miles for Darlene. It's my first marathon. And I'm at the line, CNN comes out, we're standing out alive, we're ready to go with Tom Dreesen, about to run his first marathon. Tom, tell us about Frank Sinatra. <laughs> <laughs> I think I just got a clue. Well, tell me about uh, one of the other people that you've worked with besides <laughs> Frank Sinatra. <laughs> yeah, but, I have, but, but all of them, and, and all of them it, you know, became good friends. But I realized that, and, and let me digress a minute. Frank and I were doing one-nighters all over the country. We're coming back here to the desert. We just get left New Orleans, and we're, we're flying over the mountain, and he said to me, uh, Tommy, it's a Thursday. He said, are you going to spend the weekend here? Because his jet would go back to Van Nuys. I live in Sherman Oaks. And, and, but if I was going to stay the week, I'd just stay here. I'd say, no, I'm going, it was a Thursday, I'm going tomorrow to do The Tonight Show. Uh, on Friday. He said, oh, I'll call Fred DeCordova. I'll get you out of it. I said, no, I don't want to get out of it. It's my 50th appearance on the show, and they're making a big deal of it. He said, oh, is that a record? 50 appearances for a comedian? And I said, no, I think Rodney Dangerfield, David Brenner, Joan Rivers may have done more, but it doesn't matter, Frank. No matter what I do with my life, I could find a cure to cancer. When I die, my obituary is going to say the comedian who toured with Frank Sinatra. Yeah. He said, well, maybe my obituary will say the singer who toured with Tom Dreesen. We both start <laughs> laughing like two high school <laughs> sophomores. But it's come to pass that everywhere I go, David Letterman, I couldn't do his show without, and I did it four times a year. He'd yeah. say, tell me a Sinatra story. Yeah. So finally, I put into a 90-minute show of my life and all the things I've gone through in my life before I was ever in show business to show business to Sammy Davis, to, I mean to The Tonight Show, to Sammy Davis, to Dean, to Frank. And it's great stories, funny stories, as you know, and I have them laughing, but then I take them to the funeral and I have them in tears, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and then I get them laughing again. I've always thought that a good comedian can make you laugh for an hour and a half, but a great comedian can make you laugh and cry in that hour and a half. And the I fans only, of the emotions. I only saw two of them do it, Red Skelton and Richard Pryor. Really? And I always said, I want to do that one day. I want to challenge myself. So it's a fun, a fun evening, you know. Well, I, I, yeah, I know it is. But 
you, how, you the first time you ever heard Frank Sinatra music. Tell us, because that's where the whole story that's starts. A, yeah, well, I, I, as you know, the theater goes dark. A, a film comes out. Dennis Farina, God rest his soul, narrates yes. my life. I come out and I do stand-up comedy, but I, after a certain time, I segue to a bar where there's a bottle of Jack Daniels, and I tell a joke, and all the lights go out, and Frank comes on the screen singing. It's quarter to three. There's no one in the place except you and me. I let that mood set in. When he gets to the chorus, make it one for my—I mean, the, make it one for my baby and one for for the road. The spotlight hits me, and now I'm in a bar, and the, I've come home, and the audience is in a bar with me. And I tell them the first time I heard that voice, I was eight years old, shining shoes in a bar on the south side of Chicago, and he was on the jukebox. And I take the audience from that little boy hearing Sinatra on the jukebox on the south side of Chicago to one day carrying his coffin out of a church in Beverly Hills. So I take them on the journey. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I talk about I, and a lot of things, including Tim Reed and I were America's first black and white comedy team. History shows we were the last. We, you know, <laughs> first and last. First and okay. last. There were none after, which speaks volumes. That was 45 years ago, and there's never wow. been another black and white comedy team. And it was before there were comedy clubs. So we worked black-owned, black-operated clubs, and I explained that to the audience, what it was like in that era, that time, what we went through, and how the team split up, and on to The Tonight Show, how I went alone, and, and how I met Sammy Davis, and ended up, and how I met Dean in a bar. Where else are you going to meet Dean Martin, but in a bar, you know, but... Well, yeah. let's go back to when you were a little boy. Were you always funny? You know, I always loved telling jokes. I, 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 I just did. I shined shoes in all the bars in my neighborhood. I had eight brothers and sisters. We lived in a shack. Five of us slept in one bed. Uh, we had no bathtub, no shower, no hot water. It was a rat-infested, roach-infested mm. shack. So <clears throat> I would shine shoes in all the bars to help feed my brothers and sisters. And uh, my one bar, my mom was a bartender in the last bar I went into. The guy behind the bar was Frank Pullis. He was my mother's brother-in-law, my uncle. And he told jokes behind the bar. And it fascinated me. It fascinated me that he could, out of, with his vocabulary and his vernacular, he could cause this sound to come out of your body, this laughter that would fill the room like electricity and unite everybody. I was so fascinated by that, and I would start telling his jokes, many that should not be told on the Catholic school program. You know. <laughs> or talk of the desert. <laughs> or talk of the desert, yeah. <laughs> but you, so your uncles really inspired you to do this. Yeah, he, but I thought that was interesting what you said, that you, you united everybody. Yeah. And it, as a little boy, whenever I heard laughter, yeah. I gravitated to it. I wanted to see what was I, making people laugh. You know, I wrote a poem, I'm not going to do it for you, but it's called The Sound of Laughter. And, and the first line is, as far back as I can remember, or shortly thereafter, I love to hear the sound of laughter. You know? And I still do. I mean, I just, I, I, it's, stand-up comedy, in my opinion, is the greatest profession on the planet. If you can survive, there's a lot of heartache and a lot of rejection, but if you can survive, what greater joy is there than you're making people healthy? Laughter, we now know, is healing. That's right, absolutely. You know, we now know, Norman Cousins, who wrote the book, uh, laughter math. And he wrote another book called *The Anatomy of an Illness*. He, in, in those books, he talks about how he had a heart condition and was supposed to die. He was in the hospital. Doctors told him because of stress, negative input, that he had made him ill. He thought, laying in the hospital, if negative input made me ill, uh, then positive input should make me well. He checked out of the hospital. He'd only watch *I Love Lucy* reruns, *Candid Camera*, *Three Stooges*, *The Marx Brothers*. He'd only listen to comedy albums. He'd never watch evening news. Wouldn't read the papers. He, he lived 27 years after the doctors told him he was going to die. And what they did was they did research, UCLA, of what happens to the human body when it laughs. We all know that laughter is psychologically a deterrent, because if you're watching a comedian laughing, you're not thinking of your problems. And the brain can't think of two thoughts at the same time. So if you're laughing at this comedian, it's a deterrent psychologically. But UCLA did research, when the, human, when the body laughs, the human brain releases endorphins into the bloodstream. That's why after a hearty laugh, after you've laughed so hard, and you go, oh, and the <laughs> sense of well-being comes over you, yeah. your body's going to an actual chemical change. Laughter is psychologically uplifting and physiologically therapeutic. So comedians are physicians of the soul. So you have to call me Dr. Dreesen for the rest. <laughs> yes, thank you, Dr. Dreesen. I will do that. <laughs> But, but that's the joy of that, you know. And, okay, we're going to jump over here a little bit, but 
you talked about you worked with all of these people and then Frank Sinatra hired you to be his opening act for mm -hmm. 14 years. Yeah, it was supposed to be when, what happened was I was working with Smokey Robinson at Caesars yeah. in Lake Tahoe mm -hmm. and Frank was appearing next door at Harris where I had worked many times with Sammy Davis and with, with different artists. And so when I saw Frank was appearing there, after my show one night, I bolted off stage. I didn't even change out of my stage clothes. And I ran in there because I wanted to, I saw Frank once before. And Frank Sinatra created more excitement walking to the microphone than most people do with their whole act. When he walked out, the electricity that would hit that room. So I didn't want to miss that opening. I'm running into the showroom at Harris so I can catch the show. And the vice president of Harris Hotel, Holmes Hendrickson, saw me. And he said, Tommy, come here. And he, Holmes was a real nice guy, a real powerful guy. And he booked me at Harris, and he was standing next to a big heavy set guy with a cigar. And I went over there reluctantly, he said, Tommy, this is Mickey Rudin. That was Frank Sinatra's lawyer. Mm -hmm. And I recognized the name. Yeah. And he said, Mickey, this is Tom Dreesen, and I think Tom would make a great opening act for Frank Sinatra. And the lawyer went, like he heard it like a million everybody, times. Yeah, yeah, everybody here we go again. Yeah. And the lawyer winked at the vice president, but I caught the wink. He said, hey, kid, if I gave you a week with Frank, would you want more than uh, 50,000? <laughs> I said, Mr. Rudin, put it this way. If you gave me a week with Frank, would you want more than 50,000? <laughs> And he exactly. laughed and, and he said, I like this kid. Yeah. A week later, they gave me one week with Frank. And it, we went out to dinner that night. Him and Barbara and him took me out to dinner. In the middle of the meal, I can remember like it was yesterday, he set his knife and his fork down. He said, I like your material and I like your style. I'd like you to do a few other dates with me if you're interested. And I didn't say, let me check my calendar. Yeah. I said, yeah. And it turned into 14 years, 45, 50 cities, and the greatest friendship. Yeah. And, and, uh, and something I'll never. I turned down more sitcoms. In those 14 years, and most comedians get offered in a lifetime. But I knew that I was touring the world with probably the greatest entertainer, arguably the greatest career show business has ever known. That's right. You know, being an entertainer is subjective, but he arguably the greatest career. This is a man who not only was a brilliant singer, but a brilliant actor, won the Academy oh, Award. And a dancer, too. And, and, I mean, and dancer it's, amazing. With Gene it's Kelly. amazing. Yes, exactly. Never took an acting lesson. Yes, I know. Never took an acting lesson. So his career, all of that mystique about him, this, this incredible singer and this incredible actor, and dance with Gene Kelly, and then the whole mob thing. Was he connected? Was he? All of that mystique about him, you know, it, it, it made, it, it, he sold out till he died. He sold out in Argentina. He sold out in Moscow. He sold out in, in Japan. He was 78 years old. <laughs> he sold 20,000 seaters. Name me an entertainer, a singer right. that ever did that for 60 years. Yeah. Amazing career. Yeah. Those Bobby Soxers helped at the very beginning, huh? That was the launch. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I mean, it, you know, that he once said something in an interview that I reminded him of. He was a young guy and I heard it when I was a kid. The guy was interviewing, he said, four things you need to be, to be a star as a boy singer. And he used that term, because in the big band era, they called them boy singers right. and, and girl singers in, in the big band. He said, the, the four things you need to be a superstar. Number one, he said, young women, you know, w want to make love to you. Number two, older women want to mother you. Number three, little kids wish you were their dad. And number four, the guys want to hang out with you. <laughs> now. I've met many singers that had two of those qualities or three, but all four. In the end, the guys wanted to hang out with him. Yeah. The high rollers, the players. He yeah. sold out the hotels. The drop in the pit, the, how much was gamble, was enormous when Frank Sinatra was there. Give me 500 Frank Sinatra fans. You can, if I'm a, on a casino, mm -hmm. you can have 20,000 Barbara Streisand fans or Engelbert Humperdinck or Tom Jones, with all due respect. Sinatra fans gambled. They, they were the guys. You know, the guys, they, they wanted to be around Frank, you know. Yeah, absolutely. There's no question about that. Well, in, in this mystique, in this desert, it's so oriented Frank Sinatra. I mean, I went out to dinner one night. I, I kind of talked to everybody. I'm, yeah. I know said about Co you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, kind of mis call me Miss Congeniality. But anyway, and this guy had made his trek that year to come to Palm Springs to walk in the steps where Frank Sinatra had been. And he uh -huh. goes to the cemetery. And uh, I mean, I was just amazed that, he, that people do this. Everybody has family. I mean, the Beatles had their fans. Yep. Of course, of course, uh, you know, uh, Elvis had his fans, you know, and still do. They still do. Frank Sinatra's music will carry him into the next century, into the next century. Because a singer of love songs is a singer of love songs. But no one interpreted lyrics the way he did. Oh, there's no no one breathed the way he did. He had a breathing technique that he told me about one time. He said when he was a young boy singer in a Tommy Dorsey band, he said he was just a kid and he was watching Tommy Dorsey play trombone in front of him. 
like doing Marie, and he'd have like um, 18 bars, ba da ba da ba da ba ba da ba da ba da And Frank's watching him, and with 18 bars, he never saw his back expand for air. So he said to Tommy Dorsey, how do you do that? I, you don't, I don't see you going for air. He said, I learned a thing you singers can't do. I breathe through the corners of my mouth, circular breathing. And Frank said, I can do that. And Frank said, you will be my music. You will be my song. I just took air in the corner of my mouth. Frank, that's why sometimes you see Frank like this, and, and you have his head to the side. He took an air. You never caught him in the rest period. I never heard that before, yeah, Tom. You never caught him breathing. Yeah, interesting. You know, you'll hear a lot of singers gasping, yeah. and you never caught Sinatra yeah. doing that. Interesting. He could breathe different than all the other artists, you know. Yeah, really. Mm -hmm. Well, I also want to tell, because you've been a huge part of this desert with the Frank Sinatra golf tournament. And the Bob Hope Classic. And the Bob Hope. I will always be the Bob Hope to me, yeah, yeah. <laughs> whatever they're calling it this coming year. Um, but 27 years of the Sinatra Golf Tournament, and now, sadly, Barbara got ill, and it, it ended, and, but, but we do have another one coming up. But you were at Barbara's funeral. You spoke at Barbara's I funeral. I was a Paul Bear. I was a Paul Bear for Frank and a Paul Bear for Barbara. Something yeah. I'll always, be, always hold yeah. dear to me, you know, yeah. that, yeah, it was, it was, she, she was just, you know, Frank Sinatra had the great, he said, she's a great broad. You know, now, people would, today, would politically correct people, say, how could you do that? Frank Sinatra, when he said, she's a great broad, he, his interpretation was a girl that could mingle with the creme of the creme of the White House during yeah. the day yeah. and hang out with the guys at night. Yeah. And Barbara could do that. Yeah. And so could Angie Dickinson yeah. and a lot of those great gals, Jill St. John, you know. And, if, and if, the, if the conversation got what they thought would be rough, they'd say, good night, boys, and they'd leave. <laughs> Excuse me, they get offended by it, you know. But Barbara was truly, um, in so many ways, uh, you know, she uh, invited me into her home and treated they treated me like a son. I, I, I you know, I'll always treasure that treasure that relationship, you know. But what a legacy, Barbara and Frank, because he was here when he, when they started the Barbara Sinatra Children's Center, mm -hmm. and hopefully it'll go on for years and years and years and years. When you think about what the Barbara Sinatra Children's Center, that at a time when no one would discuss. Yes. sexually abused children, you know, b emotionally abused, physically abused, but sexually abused children. And Barbara, at that time, and Barbara said, no, we have to do something for them. And the Barbara Sinatra Children's Center, as you know, turns no child away, right. turns no child away. And, and, uh, and that in Frank, you know, that became his favorite charity. And that's what he told me when we were, again, flying in here. And he said, Tommy, I'm going to do a golf tournament, and we're going to raise money for the Barbara Sinatra Children's Center, and I want you to perform with me. And I'm thinking it was one year. I said, oh, yeah, sure. It turned into 29 years, I think it was. <laughs> but this year they're holding it at Bighorn, but it's, it won't be celebrity-driven. I think Joe Mantegna is coming down and myself. Um, but, it, it, you know, they used to have like 70 celebrities. This year it's going to be done with the membership and their guests, I guess, at Bighorn. And they think they can raise as much money. And, and that's good. God bless that's, them. As long as it keeps that's going. That's right, exactly. But, it, but I think it starts on like December 10th or 11th and it yeah. ends on his birth date on December, December 12th. 12th. Well, December 9th, I'm appearing at the McCallum oh, Theater. Of course you are, yes. And, and December 10th, the next day, um, so a lot of the people that are coming to the golf tournament are coming to the show, and then the next day we have like a welcoming party, and then we play on the 11th, and then on the 12th... Uh, Which is his Frank Sinatra's birthday. Frank Sinatra's birthday. We're all going to go that night over to McCallum again to watch Barry Manilow. Yes, oh, for his Christmas show. Yeah, where his he, Christmas show. Yeah. Uh, as he did in the past years, donate part of the income from to the Barbara Sinatra Children's Bar yeah, Center. Yeah. 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 So I'm, I'm looking forward to that because I, you know, how I met Barry Manilow when I was with the comedy team years ago. We were working a place in Chicago called Mr. Kelly's. Yes. We we're opening for Bette Midler, and Bette had this keyboard player, mm -hmm. this little skinny kid with glasses, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. playing the keyboard. And if somebody would have told me one day that boy is going to be a sex symbol all over America, <laughs> I went. <laughs> it was Barry Manilow. It was Barry, yeah. and he, he became. I love his music, and, and I, but especially Weekend in New England. That song is so. So touching, and so, and he does it so well, you know. Yeah. Well, he's made a lot of hits. There's no question about that. And so you need to come support Tom Dreesen at the McCallum Theater on December 9th for his one-man show, a tribute to Sinatra, which is it's really phenomenal. But then also, if you can, I, I found on the Barbara Sinatra Children's Center website where you can sign up to become a player in the golf tournament for the one day. Oh, good. Well, it might so, be. It might be. Uh, yeah. Well, it's yeah. members and guests. I'm right. sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and, and, and if, if they come to my show, I'm not going to sing. But I want to tell you stories 
that you've never heard before about Frank Sinatra. I'm going to tell you a side of Frank Sinatra that a lot of people didn't know. The nights that I rode around the desert here with him till dawn. The nights he'd come to on his compound, he'd wake me up in my bungalow, say, Tommy, let's take a ride, and we'd take a ride, and the things that we had talked about. And especially toward the end of his life, he became a little more melancholy, mm -hmm. and he would talk about growing up in Hoboken, what that was like. And, and stories when he first came to the desert, how he fell in love with the desert down here, you know. It's, it's a, a friendship that, that, um, that very few people are able, I'm one of the few living people on this planet today right. who really knew him. That's There's right. other people who met him once or twice and wrote four or five books about yeah, him. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> but, but, uh, so when's your book coming out, Tom? Yeah, you know, <laughs> people have asked me for years, yeah. you know, but they always, you know, and, and, and I'd go to New York and do the Letterman shows all the time, and these publishers, I, I talked to 15 publishers who I'd take the meeting, but they all wanted, can you give me a little dirt? Can you tell me about, uh, the, the, you know, wine, women, and song? And I said, he was so in love with Barbara when I met him that, that there was, I saw none of that. Yeah. And, and, that uh, and also they don't know about the mob, and I, I saw none of that, you know. He's, you know, he just was a spectacular entertainer. Was he flawed? Oh my God, was he flawed. Did he have a dark side? He had a dark side, you know. Well, we all are flawed. Nobody's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. I know about the dark side, but <laughs> nobody's perfect. Yeah, but, but, but he, you know, I think somewhere there's a scale. At the end of your life, did you take out more than you put in? Or by, Frank Sinatra put more in than he took out. Yeah. He was the most generous human being I ever met in my life. He did things for charities that no one will ever know. He did things for people no one will ever know because he didn't want you to know. That's right. You know? Exactly. Very, very, a very benevolent guy. No. You know? no. There's a story that I was told, and I don't know if you can back this up, but it was really cute, that uh, Sinatra had somebody valet his car, and he gave him a $200 tip, and he says, so when was the last time? Let me set it up the first way. Oh, you still set it up? Well, okay. at, at the Mommy San restaurant. Okay. First of all, I talk about this in my show, but he tipped $100 wherever you If you gave him a, a pack of cigarettes, he'd give you $100. He brought him Jack, Jack and the Splash, was it, you got $100. A cup of coffee, you got $100. He didn't show off, he'd slip it to you. But coming out of Mommy San one night, the, 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 the valet parker pulled up his car and Frank said, what's the biggest tip you ever got? Kid said $100 and Frank gave him $200. He said, by the way, who gave you the $100? He said, you did last Friday, yeah. Mr. Sinatra. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a story. That's a good I told story. a story at his funeral that made the whole church laugh that I won't tell you here, but I'll tell it on my one-man show oh. at his funeral that just broke it because I know he'd want me to make them laugh. Right. And it was very tough for me because it's hard enough to speak at funerals, as you know. Oh, yeah. And it's even harder when you really love that person <laughs> that you're talking about. So I knew that he would want me not to, he'd want, he once said to me, he said, Tommy, Sicilians don't cry. They cry alone. In other words, you don't cry in public. He knew I'm half, half Sicilian, but half Irish. But I, he said, Sicilians don't cry, Tommy. They cry alone. I said, but I'm half Irish. He said, well, Irish cry when they change bus drivers. <laughs> <You know? laughs> he said, he said. So that night at his funeral that afternoon, I, I did not want to cry. And, 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 and all the pomp and circumstances and the choir singing and Frank's voicing, and I had to follow that. But I told a funny story that I'll tell on the one-man show that really made him laugh. But you know. Well, it's Tom Dreesen of the McCallum Theater. And if you don't know the phone number for the McCallum Theater, it's 1-760-340-ARTS for tickets. And it's at 8 o'clock on Saturday night, the December 9th. December 9th. Or you can go to my website, TomDreesen.com, oh. and, and, and it's a link to the McCallum Theater. And there's a lot of great videos on TomDreesen.com. Yeah. So, now, what stories did you not include in your one-man show about Frank Sinatra? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, well, you know, to be honest with you, I've got too much material. There, there's time. I'm sure you yeah, do I, after I, doing it for 14 years oh, with yeah. him. Oh, yeah. I, I, I've got stories. Some, some nights when I get, if it's a really attentive hour, I try not to do this, but I've gone as long as two hours, and, and, and I, I left things out. Now I try to keep it a tight 90, because that's what you should do um, with no intermission, just straight through. But there's a lot of stories. You know, when people get me like you do on an interview like this, sometimes I just go off and start telling interesting stories about Because you've got a whole half hour here, rather than a short short three or four yeah. minute interview. Yeah. Can I, I tell you a quick story that I don't tell on my one man show? Yes, please. We were in, we were in Connecticut one time, working in Connecticut at, at the Centrum. And um, in, uh, in uh, what time, oh, I can't remember the name of the time. Anyhow, I'll think of it in a minute. But um, after the show, I went to the bar with all the band guys, Ronnie Anthony, the guitar player, and people. I'm just talking to them, and it was cold out, and I hung up my uh, coat in the, in the, in the, with the coat check girl. But now, 
in the middle of dinner, Ronnie Anthony, the guitar, guitar player, said, see those two girls over there? I said, yeah. He said, they were, during the show, they laid flowers at Mr. S's feet and they wept during his performance. And I said, really, they were young girls. And we're, I said, no kidding. So now we're getting our coats checked out and the two girls were getting their coats. And one girl came up to me and she said, I saw your show tonight, you made me laugh. I said, thank you. I said, can I ask you a question? How old are you? She said, I'm 20. I said, how old is your girlfriend? She said, that's my sister. She's 18. I said, well, the reason I'm asking, the guitar player said that you wept during Frank's show. You laid flowers at his feet and you wept during his show. You're awful young to be Sinatra fans. She said, my mom and dad adored Frank Sinatra. They I loved him so much. They played his music all of our childhood. They had a big picture blown up from his album over the mantle. And she said, so that's how much they loved him. My mom and dad died last year, four months apart. Oh. She said, and my dad died first. And my, before my mom died, she said, my sister and I were by her bedside one day just talking. She talked over her life. And she told us that her and dad used to make love to Frank Sinatra's music, that we were actually conceived <laughs> to his music. So she said, tonight, while he was singing, we felt our parents' presence Aww. there. And so that's why we wept. And that's why we laid flowers at what his feet. What a beautiful story. Now, I, I, two weeks later, at, at the house here in uh, Rancho Mirage, uh, I was having dinner with Frank and Barbara. And Frank was saying, you know, a lot of young people are coming to the show. He said, Barbara, he said, have you noticed that, Tommy? And I told him this story about the two young girls. And I, I made a terrible mistake that night. I should have known. He said to me, did you get their names? And I said, no, I didn't. Because I know he would have sent them something. Yeah. And I, I regret it to this day. Yeah. You know, uh, but anyhow, that's another well, great story. That is a great story. Well, we've got Tom Dreesen spending 14 years as the opening act for Frank Sinatra and his one-man show about Frank Sinatra at the McCallum Theater on Saturday, December 9th at 8 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Tickets are 760-340-ARTS uh, uh, or They're on their website, McCallumTheater.com and TomDreesen.com on your website for the link there. Mm -hmm. And I said you should watch some of the videos with Tom. Um, and talking about Tom and Tim, the black and white comedian team, you've got some, uh, some video of that yeah. too. Tim Reed, who later became Venus Flytrap That's on right. WKRP. Yeah. And then also another show called Sister, Sister, he was the father. Yeah. And we're still the best of friends today, but we just, uh, yeah. the, the America wasn't ready for <laughs> our act. You know. uh -huh. Well, you should try again sometime, Tom. But Tom Dreesen, thank you for joining me in Talk of the Desert. Join him at the McCallum on December 9th. And thank you, audience, for joining us. For more information, email TOTDTV at questoffice.net and visit talkofthedesert.tv on the web.